Hello, dear students and friends. Next in my class series is an important topic, management of umbilical cord prolapse. Yes, it is an obstetric emergency and I'm sure all of you might have seen cases and manage them effectively. But today I would talk about the recent advances in the management of cord prolapse. So updates in the management of cord prolapse. Well, umbilical cord prolapse, as we all know, is an unpredictable obstetric emergency. The incidence ranges from one to six per thousand pregnancies and the main concern is adverse perinatal outcomes because of cord compression and vasospasm, which leads to fetal hypoxia. In the low-income countries, there is a high perinatal mortality ranging from 23 to 27%, which is a bit low in high-income countries, 10 to 6%. The incidence is higher in breech presentations and in multiple gestations, and it is influenced by population characteristics. Well, the details of my talk I've taken from American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, an expert review, in which three aspects have been highlighted. The newer definitions, the decision delivery intervals, and the various maneuvers and their effect, and what evidence has to tell us. First, coming to the definitions. Previously, there were no consistent definitions in literature, and traditionally, we used to divide it into two types, cord prolapse, which was overt or occult, and cord presentation. Now, overt cord prolapse was the descent of cord through the cervix, passing the presenting part, and in presence of ruptured membranes. This highlighted a dangerous condition, and it required immediate delivery. However, this term did not include cases where the cord had passed through the cervix, but remained in the herniated amniotic sac. The second term which we used was occult cord prolapse. This was more commonly seen in preterm gestation or cases of cervical incompetence. It was not easily diagnosed because of difficulty in vaginal visualization or palpation of the content in the herniated membranes. However, could be identified through sonographic examination, membranes if they are intact and there could be compression between the cervix and fetal part during uterine contractions. When these membranes rupture, the cord becomes unprotected in the vagina and is at risk. Therefore, fetal risk is higher in cases which have been classified as occult cord prolapse. So the term occult cord prolapse is misleading. Rather, it is an underestimation of risk of fetal outcome. In these cases, the more accurate term would be compound cord presentation, which could occur with ruptured or unruptured membranes, which means that the cord is below the presenting part, could be below the cervix, but in an intact membrane. Now let us come to the newer definitions. These have been given according to the position relationship between the umbilical cord, the cervix, the presenting part, and status of membranes. So they've been divided into three, cord prolapse, cord presentation, and compound cord presentation. In cord prolapse, the cord is below the cervix, below the presenting part. There could be ruptured or unruptured membranes, and it could be inside or outside the vagina. In cord presentation, it is above the cervix, but below the presenting part. In compound cord presentation, it is above the cervix, but alongside the presenting part. In all these cases, membranes could be ruptured or unruptured. As you can see in this figure, cord prolapse, cord below the cervix. Cord presentation, cord above the cervix, but below the presenting part. Compound cord presentation, cord above the cervix and alongside the presenting part. Now, if you look at this picture, this tells us the reason why this classification was given and how it helps in management. In figure A, the patient is in supine position before turning the patient to Trellenberg position. And you can see the cord is lying outside the cervix in an herniated sac, which is intact. 
This fetus is in transverse lie with its back close to the cervix. In figure B, now this patient has been turned to Trellenberg position 15 degree. The fetal back is away from the internal os. In C, while the patient is still in Trellenberg position, maternal urinary bladder is filled up to 300 ml. So in all these, these two pictures, you can see that the cord has not gone inside. And so anytime, if the membranes are ruptured, this fetus could be at risk. And two maneuvers have been tried, Trellenberg position and filling the maternal urinary bladder with saline. So this patient was at risk and had been sent immediately to operation theater for a cesarean section. So now let us look at the risk factors. It primarily occurs in two settings. First, when the presenting part does not fill the pelvis, which could be because of maternal or fetal reasons. And second, when any obstetric intervention or any maneuver has been tried, that may dislodge the presenting part and the cord may come down. This is the list, the general uh, factors, and then the procedure-related factors. General factors could be multiparity, low birth weight, preterm labor, some fetal congenital anomalies, breech presentation, abnormal lie, transverse, oblique, or even unstable, second of twin polyhydramnios, unengaged presenting part, low-lying placenta. While if you do any procedure like ARM, artificial rupture of membranes with a high presenting part, vaginal manipulation, of fetus with ruptured membranes, even an external cephalic version, internal podalic version, stabilizing induction of labor, insertion of intrauterine pressure transducer, or even large balloon catheter for induction of labor. If the presenting part is not well fixed, there could be cord prolapse. So we must remember these associated factors. Now let us look at urgency in delivery and fetal outcome. It is said that Whenever there is cord prolapse, the mainstay of treatment is emergency delivery if there is a viable fetus. Delaying delivery for extremely premature cases with ruptured membranes has been reported with good outcome, but it is exceptional, only rare. In arranging for an emergent cesarean delivery, we must consider two factors, maternal risk versus fetal risk, and both should be balanced. There is no consensus on optimal decision to delivery time interval. Now let us look at what evidence tells us. The time of cord prolapse and onset of fetal hypoxia may have occurred well before the diagnosis or when the decision for delivery has been made. So before you take up a decision, there could have been fetal hypoxia. Therefore, decision delivery interval is not an adequate predictor of perinatal outcomes. The fetal outcomes were analyzed according to different fetal heart rate patterns and duration of fetal heart rate abnormalities and then decision to delivery interval. In that, cord arterial pH deteriorated significantly with bradycardia to delivery interval in cases that presented with fetal bradycardia and that decreased cord arterial pH decreased by 0 0.009 per minute. The risk of severe acidosis was 80% when bradycardia to delivery interval was more than 20 minutes, but only 17% when the interval was less than 20 minutes. In contrast, there was no correlation between cord arterial pH and decision, deceleration to delivery interval or decision to delivery interval. The belief that intermittent cord compression causes recurrent fetal heart deterioration or decelerations which were potentially reversible with less risk of fetal hypoxia. In contrast, see, we do not know whether this fetal bradycardia is reversible or irreversible. So when it is irreversible, which is because of persistent cord compression or vasoconstriction, secondary to exposure, because of lower temperature inside or outside the vagina, this could be the reason for perinatal morbidity and at times mortality. This has a great implication on the management of umbilical cord prolapse in terms of urgency of delivery. So already there could have been bradycardia which was reversed or there could be bradycardia which is irreversible and we do not know and therefore the urgency of delivery cannot be planned. 
Although prompt delivery is desirable, it has to be weighed against maternal risk of an urgent cesarean delivery and general anesthesia. So complications to the mother also need to be considered. If general anesthesia is given, there could be intubation failure and aspiration pneumonia, which are the major problems. Now in cases in those in which normal fetal heart rate pattern is there or dissolutions have occurred without bradycardia, the risk of fetal hypoxia is low. In those cases, we can consider spinal anesthesia instead of general anesthesia and a decision to delivery interval within 30 minutes is acceptable. However, we must continuously monitor the fetal heart rate. In those cases in which there's persistent bradycardia, delivery in a short interval is critical. Arterial cord pH drops rapidly at a rate of 0 0.009 per minute and a bradycardia to delivery interval of less than 20 minutes should be achieved to minimize the chance of fe severe fetal acidosis. Now, another controversy, the optimal mode of birth, whether go for a cesarean section or if the cervix is fully dilated, whether to go for an instrumental delivery. Cesarean section is recommended when vaginal birth is not imminent. And category one cesarean section should be performed with the aim of achieving birth within 30 minutes or less if the cord prolapse is associated with suspicious or pathological fetal heart rate pattern, but without compromising maternal safety. However, a category two cesarean section is considered in those women in whom fetal heart rate pattern is normal and a continuous tracing has been done at any time, if the CTG becomes abnormal, we can recategorize to category one and consider for immediate birth. In all such cases, discussion with an anesthetist is essential to decide the appropriate form of anesthesia. Regional anesthesia, which is comparatively safe, can be considered in the hands of an experienced and expert anesthetist. Verbal consent is satisfactory for category one cesarean section. Operative vaginal delivery at full dilatation, if it can be accomplished quickly and safely, taking care to avoid impeachment of cord can be considered. In some circumstances, like in cases of after internal podalic version for second twin, a breech extraction can be considered. However, we do need a neonatologist a practitioner competent in resuscitation of a newborn and always paired blood samples should be taken. So now coming to the third point, the various maneuvers to manage cord prolapse. The aim of these maneuvers is immediate relief or prevention of cord compression while delivery is being arranged. They help in reducing the risk of hypoxic brain injury and subsequent cerebral palsy and mortality. A number of maneuvers have been suggested. There's no one which is ideal and more than one may be required at times. There are two approaches, pushing up and pulling by gravitational force. In pushing up manual elevation, like putting a hand transvaginally and pushing the fetal head up or filling the maternal urinary bladder. In pulling, is by gravitational force after elevating the pelvis. They include knee chest position, Trellenberg position, and wedging of the maternal pelvis. As you can see, A is transvaginal manual elevation, the two fingers. B is filling the maternal unit bladder. C is knee chest position. D is Trellenberg position. And E and F are wedging the maternal pelvis in supine and lateral position respectively. Now first, pulling by gravitational force has two potential advantages over pushing from below. So in pulling after elevating the maternal pelvis, the gravitational force reduces the risk of further prolapse from inside to outside vagina. And the effect of pushing up methods depend on the initial station of fetal presenting part. Higher the station, lesser is its effectiveness. So the effect of gravity by elevating the pelvis is advantageous. Now let us look at the advantages and disadvantages of the various maneuvers. Pushing approach, 
that is transvaginal manual elevation is quick and simple. No instrument is required. You do it with the help of your two fingers. But however, it is unpleasant. Manpower is required. Elevation effect is modest. It is difficult when station is high or it is a transverse lie. And it has a potential of creating more room for further prolapse of cord. Now, when you fill the maternal urinary bladder, the elevation effect is good when you fill it with 500 ml. No pan power is required once bladder filling is complete. Suitable during long distance transportation or when there's a delay in delivery when it's expected. However, disadvantages, you, ne you need the catheter and you need normal saline. So instrumentation is required. Time is required to completely fill the bladder. Emptying of bladder is necessary before cesarean section. This too is less effective when the fetal head is at a higher station. Now the pulling approach, the trendling bug position or wedging can be quickly performed if the patient is on an adjustable bed or a wedge or pillow is available. Elevation effect is not affected by a position of fetal head, that is the station. It can prevent further prolapse out of the vagina and manpower is not required. However, for this, you need an adjustable bed, you need a wedge. Tilting angle may be limited by maternal discomfort and elevation effect is only modest. The second position, knee chest position, it has the greatest elevation effect, which is not affected by initial fetal station. No instrumentation is required. It can prevent further prolapse out of the vagina and manpower is not required, but it can be exhausting and difficult for pregnant women, especially during long distance transportation. Difficult for patients who are under regional anesthesia for uh, labor and need the patient's cooperation. Potential of causing further trauma or stimulation during positioning of cord if the cord is outside the vagina. Now let us look at which is the best maneuver as per evidence. This is from a study conducted by Guan Wong et al. on transperineal ultrasound assessment of fetal head elevation by maneuvers used for managing umbilical cord prolapse. In this, they did a transperineal sonographic measurement of the parasagittal angle of progression, that is the angle between the longitudinal axis of the pubic bone and the lowest convexity of fetal skull. This was an indicator for fetal head station. They measured it during each maneuver and its effect was studied. Now, transperineal measurement, as you can see, in supine position, you can see the angle, 113.6 degree. In knee chest position, 82.2%. And after filling the urinate bladder with 500 ml of saline, it is 86.4%. So from this, you can see that Nietzsche's position is the best position. According to this recent observational study, in which they evaluated the degree of elevation effect by various maneuvers in a group of 20 women carrying a cephalic presentation and singleton fetus at term, Nietzsche's position resulted in greatest elevation effect of fetal head with reduction of parasagittal angle of progression by 23. That means three stations up. The elevation effect was independent of initial fetal head station. So that was considered the best maneuver. It was followed by filling the maternal urinary bladder with 500 ml of saline, reduction of angle by 14 degrees and two stations up. Elevation was station dependent. However, greater degree of fetal head elevation was achieved when initial fetal head station was lower and there was no advantage in elevation if the initial fetal presenting part is high. So look at, let us look at this algorithm for acute management of cord prolapse with ruptured membranes on the basis of various maneuvers which we need to do. If there is an alive fetus with cord prolapse and vaginal delivery is not imminent, the first line maneuver to be tried would be Trenenberg 15 degree wedging or digital elevation. If there are uterine contractions, then we would require acute tocolysis. But if no contractions and cord lying outside the vagina, 
sometimes warm wrapping can be done but if it is not outside the vagina and there is persistent fetal distress no persistent fetal distress if there is persistent fetal distress you would need to consider cesarean delivery but the second line maneuvers while you are planning for delivery which can be tried would include knee chest position or bladder filling or steep trenenberg 30 degree now a few words about funic reduction that is replacement of this prolapsed cord inside reduction or replacing the prolapsed cord into the uterine cavity was practiced in early decades of last century when cesarean delivery was still considered a high risk procedure although such reduction or reposition may help to avoid cesarean delivery it does not improve the perinatal outcome as it was seen in those days However, there are several challenges in performing cord reduction. The first is difficult to reduce a long loop of cord through a mildly dilated cervix. Then manipulation of cord may cause cord compression or vasoconstriction. And third, the successfully reduced cord may again prolapse and it may become a compound presentation. However, funic reduction is not recommended unless other maneuvers have failed or urgent cesarean delivery is not feasible. It should only be limited in those cases in which there's a short segment of collapsed cord with at least four centimeters dilatation and the presenting part is at a higher station or above one station. Attempts should not last longer than two minutes and to facilitate funic reduction, simultaneous elevation of the presenting part via suprapubic approach, the Trenlenberg position or immediate tocolysis may be attempted. So in a very, very few cases, such funic reduction may be done. The clinically practical approach in management of cord prolapse. Let us look at the steps. First, call for assistance and prepare for emergent delivery. You need to call the nursing staff, anesthetist, other obstetric staff operate, need to alert the operating room staff and pediatric providers. Initiate maneuvers for intrauterine resuscitation. Monitor the fetal heart rate. If prolapse is overt, minimize manipulating an overtly prolapsed cord and avoid exposing it to the cold environment. Perform emergent delivery if by the most rapid and safe route, which is a cesarean. In selected cases, operative vaginal delivery may be considered and the type of anesthesia, neuraxial versus general, has to be decided. It all depends whether there is a catheter already in place and depends on the urgency of delivery. Now, if prolapse is occult, resultative maneuvers may lead to category 1 or 2 tracing due to resolution of occult prolapse or because of alternative diagnosis which is responsible for category three tracing. The decision whether to proceed for an urgent delivery is always based on fetal heart tracing. If resuscitation ameliorates the concerning characteristics, an expected management can be tried, which includes intrauterine resuscitation, manually elevate the presenting part, place it, the patient in Trellenberg or Nietzsche's position, or retrofill the bladder, administer to a colitic if there are uterine contraction and consider manually replacing the cord. Now you can remember this algorithm through the mnemonic cord. C for consider at every vaginal examination. Consider for cord prolapse. If abnormal fetal heart rate was there on spontaneous rupture of membranes, after membrane rupture, there could be abnormal fetal heart rate and risk of cord prolapse. Organize help. R for relief pressure by the various maneuvers. And D is taking a decision for birth, whether emergency delivery or instrumental delivery or expectant management. Then team training is important. All team members need to be proactive and they need to know their roles. And this kind of team training can significantly lower the time from diagnosis to delivery and improve perinatal outcomes. So thank you. If you have any questions, you are most welcome. Do subscribe to my channel, which has other presentations on obstetric emergencies, as well as the older version of 
presentation on umbilical cord prolapse. Thank you.